Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, this session of the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee. Um, today we have one item on our agenda. It is a report from a contractor regarding the composition of Montgomery County Boards, Commissions, and Committees. Um, we want to thank everyone for joining us today, and uh, we have a guest council member, Council Member Balcom, and we want to thank her, and in particular, uh, you know, her pushing for us to take a, a deeper dive on these issues, and in particular, looking at um, geography. Um, so this report was one that um, the committee requested because we wanted to take a I'll dive into our boards and commissions, their membership, how they were appointed, and we wanted to look at who was involved in making rec recommendations and active in public policy for all of us here in the county. Um, and we have quite a few <laughs> boards and commissions, over 90, um, and so it was a great deal to look at. So I just want to first thank our Office of Legislative Oversight uh, for their work on this thank the contractor who worked on this report, who we'll hear from today. And I also want to thank um, the staff who handle our board and commission um, appointments uh, for being here today. <laughs> so thank you there and from our, uh, our council staff, Sarah uh, Tannenbaum as well. Um, so as I said, we know that some of our colleagues have been looking at a deeper dive for this and we have an excellent report that, as with many of our OLO reports, uh, leads to recommendations and more questions that we have. So I think without further intro on this, I'm going to um, turn it over to our OLO staff to kick us off and introduce the contractor. Uh, yes, good morning. My name is Kristen Latham. I'm an analyst with the Office of Legislative Oversight. Um, you pretty much covered what you know my intro was going to be, so I appreciate that. Um, so I will just turn it over. This is our contractor, Arc Strata. This is Lakeisha and Marjorie. Um, they did almost all of the work, so I just kind of helped guide a little bit. So I will turn it over to them to give a presentation, and then we have folks here to answer questions and have a discussion afterwards. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you for having us here. We're a, a local Montgomery County uh, research and consulting firm, 100% uh, woman of color led. Uh, and so we really appreciate uh, this effort and being involved. And so we are presenting on the study on member selection for Montgomery County uh, citizen boards, commissions, and committees, and just wanted to, I know you touched on the purpose a little bit, but wanted to touch on it. I guess we can go into the uh, the guiding questions here that we summarized from the RFP, and it's it was uh, which boards, commissions, and committees exist, and how are members selected? What is the demographic composition of these groups and how representative are they of broader county demographics? And then what is the history of service of current members um, and term waiver requests? And I'll turn it over to um, Lakeisha for methods. Good morning and thank you again for this opportunity. So for, I um, want to just describe the methods of this study. So this was a mixed method study where we looked at um, we administered a survey to um, BCC members as well as staff and liaisons. We looked at um, existing information about um, the boards, um, committees, and councils, and also conducted um, key informant interviews. So some of the key information we were looking at was demographics, the um, members' engagement and um, impressions of the BCCs, looking at background information about their um, history of service, and roles and responsibilities of the staff and liaisons, as well as recruitment, appointment, and selection um, information. So, um, and also looking at member terms and term waivers. So there was a, a, um, a breadth of information that we looked at. And we analyzed the, um, we pulled key themes from the interviews as well as from, they were open-ended questions in the survey, so we pulled key themes from those as well as looked at the quantitative data. So we worked with uh, the office of uh, work with OLO as well as the county executives um, BCC team to get contact lists and to invite uh, members and liaisons to participate. So we be were provided a list that contained um, over 1,400 member positions, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, member names and staff names. With the breakdown here, that there were 1,164. Uh, member positions, 99 that were vacant, and 77 staff and liaisons. And then from that, um, the county executive and council staff and members were excluded from the member list, and so that 
um, reduced the list to 1,039 BCC members, and then we emailed them, and there were um, 977 deliverable emails, and then we also emailed the staff and liaison. So there were over 1,100 people contacted, and then from that, 658 participated with 594 BCC members and 62 staff and liaisons, and we also spoke with two county staff who administered uh, administer BCCs. And then in terms of what we found, um, oh, sorry. thank you. <laughs> in terms of what we found, uh, demographics, we uh, gathered the information from a spreadsheet that was shared with us from the county executive's office that had um, some demographic information, primarily gender, uh, racial and ethnic information um, was less available. So we made sure we added um, this information in our surveys, uh, and then we combined what we gathered from surveys with the county executive's office in terms of racial and ethnic background to try to strengthen um, what was there. And this is uh, what shook out, um, about 41% of members did not share their racial and ethnic identity. Uh, most respondents identified as white, about 52%. Um, black African American um, was the second most common um, racial ethnic identity group, or at 28%. And then all the other groups were really below 10%. Um, and so the third most common racial and ethnic identity group identified was Asian, followed by Latino. Um, at 7%, and then 4% of folks identified as multiracial, and then the least represented groups were uh, Middle Eastern or North African and American Indian Indigenous uh, First Nation groups. In terms of gender composition, there was a lot more of this data, um, but generally women disclose their gender more often than men, um, so you'll see only 37% of respondents shared they were male, right? So there's a gap there. Um, and then so we took this data and we looked a little deeper into how folks were shaking out within BCCs, right? Because initially it looks like, oh, wow, more women are on BCCs. Um, but when we dug a little deeper, it looks like we, we mapped them out. We tried to uh, place the ones that appear to be balanced in one category and then, gr you know, groups that looked like they were predominantly male in one and then groups predominantly female in another. And so it shook out so that about one fifth appear to be balanced. Um, you know, the caveat being that we didn't know everyone's gender, right? But, um, and so we try to also look on their websites to try to make sure um, that the composition was uh, okay, we could make a call there. Um, and then while more women disclose their gender, uh, more BCCs were actually imbalanced toward male representation, right? So 42.5% um, um, were predominantly male. And then about one third of BCCs had more of a female representation. And then when we looked at the subject matter that these groups were touching on, um, the majority male groups were dealing with revenue and financial information, infrastructure, the built environment, agriculture, fire and safety, law enforcement and workforce. And then when we looked at the groups with um, the majority female representation, they pertain to social services, specifically youth and older adults, childcare services, intellectual and developmental disabilities, domestic violence, human trafficking, drug use, um, and animal services. Uh, and then in terms of geographic representation, we used the entire database for this, um, <coughs> the county executives, not the survey, because the survey was a smaller sample. Um, and so the most represented city uh, came out as Rockville, followed by Silver Spring, Bethesda, and Gaithersburg. Uh, most represented, uh, the most represented region uh, is the Mid-County region, followed by East County, but that's a Chevy Chase and then Up County. And then the most populous Up County region, Germantown, had the relatively low representation on BCCs. And another caveat here that um, some of the addresses we had were for folks' place of employment, right? And it, so it might skew Rockville a little bit, I would think. Um, but generally, I think this is uh, what folks suspected. And then the next section is about actually comparing how demographics shook out within BCCs and comparing them to their overall county um, representation. So when we looked, when we looked at the demographics, um, we there were a number of populations that were um, considered well represented and those who are underrepresented, which we'll talk about in, mo in a moment. So in terms of well represented, that's the 
um, defined as the percentage of BCC members um, who are similar to or exceed their representation or proportion in the county at large. So these would include black and African American residents and white residents. So um, the percentage of um, BCC members who identified as black um, or African American and white was similar to the general county demographics and um, also well represented on uh, boards, commissions, and, co and committees were uh, those who identify as far, part of the LGBTQ community and um, with the percentages being similar to those of national um, statistics. And so also um, individuals with disabilities were represented at a higher rate than the county population. Individuals who served in the military well represented and they are twice the rate of, um, with twi the, twice the rate of veterans in the general county population. So there were 7% of BCC members um, reported that they were veterans and the larger county population is about 3%. Older adults' participation rate was twice that of the representation in the county in those who um, were ages 65 years or older. And also those who um, rented their homes were almost represented at levels um, consistent with the county, as well as married households actually were represented at a higher rate in among BCCs at 72, around 73% than the general county population, which is 52%. And then we looked at um, the underrepresented groups. And so this is a comparison here. Um, you can see uh, a breakdown of the Latino residents, Asian residents are not as represented um, uh, as they should be given their representation in the county. I'm gonna move on to the next slide, which breaks it all out. Um, and so uh, given this lack of representation, uh, among Latinos and Asians, uh, Latino participation is only a third of their representation in the county, and Asian resident participation is slightly less than half of their representation in the county. Um, in terms of foreign born, uh, they are also underrepresented in BCC membership as they account for nearly one third of county residents, but less than one fifth of members. Um, younger residents, uh, we had folks, um, statistics for folks between 20 and 29 years of age, which account for about 12% of the county, but they're only at maybe 2% of members. Um, and single family headed households, as was discussed earlier, um, are, are not you know, represented well, given that um, about 48% of the population is not married. Um, most county residents have a bachelor's or advanced degree, which we know at 60%, um, but a substantially higher proportion is present among BCC members at 93%, which indicates an underrepresentation of residents without college or advanced degrees on BCCs. Uh, residents with annual household incomes below 75,000 were lacking as well um, in BCC membership. The annual household income of, of most members, about 73%, met or exceeded the self sufficiency standard of 123,000 for a family of four. Uh, with nearly half of members, 48%, reporting household incomes more than um, 180,000. The Up County region, uh, given its large population, was represented at a lower rate than other county areas. Um, and then in terms of gender, again, uh, I'm sure you deduced that there is a stereotypical pattern in how women participate um, or are engaged in BCCs. And we also look more closely at the, um, the BCCs in terms of um, their structure and the practices of BCCs and how they are composed. So for the overview of the structure itself, 86% of BCCs offer membership opportunities to the general public. 83% are designed with three-year terms, which is designed to allow for new individuals to advise county systems and processes, so for new members to be able um, new individuals to be able to participate in BCCs. Nearly two-thirds of BCCs require expert members, including representatives of specific agencies or, represent, or residents with specific credentials or experience. 
and 41 percent of BCCs have positions with life terms or that do not expire, terms that don't expire. And the terms are staggered for continuity and members generally are to serve no more than two consecutive full terms, nor are they to serve on multiple BCCs, which again, with the um, purpose being to promote participation and changing in, um, in member representation. So we looked more closely at who is filling the positions. So there were more than one half of positions were filled with a new member. There were 43% who um, of positions were filled with existing members or members from other BCCs. So of these, one third of the positions were filled through reappointments, and then 11% were found to have terms off of positions before filling their new position. And then again, 15% of positions have no term limits. So between those who are um, the reappointments and who are the positions that are being filled by existing members and the positions that have no term limits, these trends may contribute to a sense that new residents are not cycling through BCCs. And then in terms of term waivers, membership, as we said, is generally uh, limit limited to two consecutive terms between one and five years. But a term waiver may be requested if no other qualified individual is available to serve or if there are other circumstances that justify reappointment. So when we looked at the trends of term waivers over a seven year period between 2017 and um, 2023, there were 30 BCCs requested 65 term waivers over that period, with the most requests being made in 2018 2019 and 2021 at 21 waivers, 13 and 16 respectively. And most waivers were requested for members third terms and then the other um, waivers were requested for fourth, fifth and sixth terms. And one of the, um, when we looked more deeply and asked questions about recruitment and selection. We asked about the processes of recruitment and selection, particularly at those who um, are from underrepresented communities. And um, so this was one area uh, that we closely looked at in the study was uh, members and staff and liaisons impressions of equity, inclusion, and responsiveness. So the strengths as well as the challenges in terms of member selection and recruitment were similar in terms of the areas. So they pertain to marketing of vacant positions, recruitment and the application process, and factors that can affect participation. So in terms of strengths or successes, uh, staff and liaisons cited that, um, they most frequently cited that there were intentional efforts made to recruit, interview, and select individuals from diverse backgrounds. And these efforts included personally reaching out to individuals from underrepresented communities to encourage them to apply, and considering equity, diversity, and inclusion when reviewing applications and interviewing applicants. Another strength or success is that um, they said that advertised, positions were advertised through a variety of channels, um, such as listservs, through volunteers, commun and community organizations. And a strategy that they had found successful was for recruitment for our BCC members to recruit through their networks. In contrast, in terms of the challenges, um, there was a challenge in reaching and engaging residents from underrepresented communities. So that was a primary concern. So how to more broadly advertise uh, positions and increase awareness about BCCs. And there also was a challenge of a lack of focused outreach to underserved and underrepresented communities, including using multiple promotion methods that are culturally responsive and appropriate, and also having information in multiple languages that um, community members speak. And a final major concern was um, that there are barriers to participation, uh, particularly for individuals who may have limited time or competing demands. So uh, respondents um, said that this is a staff and liaisons um, talked about meeting locations may pose challenges for uh, residents, formats, and the time commitment, um, particularly if they're individuals who work or who have families or live in particular regions of the county. And then in terms of, in terms of uh, conclusions, considerations, and recommendations, 
Um, we you know, delved into the data that was shared with us um, and feedback recommendations that members and staff provided um, in the context of uh, building a system where you can monitor uh, demographic composition uh, and how folks are cycli cycling through BCCs. Uh, we recommended uh, strengthening existing data collection and management system practices and use of data. Um, and this is based on uh, some data we got back from liaisons, um, which indicated that 68% of BCCs do not track or monitor demographic composition of their membership. 64% um, of staff liaisons reported uh, their BCCs track membership information at either digitally or hard copy. And so we posed this question specifically to understand um, how membership was being tracked historically and how that was being kept and could it be shared, you know, um, across with the county executive's office and vice versa or across groups. Um, and then one third reported, reported uh, reportedly do not track their membership or are unaware if membership information is tracked. Um, so there are some uh, practices or processes that would need to be built out, obviously collecting the demographic data or deciding what would be collected, and then um, how do folks share with each other how folks are you know, cycling, cycling through um, their memberships. Uh, another recommendation was to employ a broad, active outreach and recruitment strategy to engage Latino, Asian, immigrant youth, and other underrepresented populations. So some of the recommendations that folks provided was to consider deliberate outreach plans to educate and prime um, underrepresented and underserved residents about participating in BCCs, proactive outreach via personal communications um, and connections with trusted cultural and community groups. Uh, and then given the large foreign-born immigrant population, um, the county may want to build awareness across generations, so not just reaching parents, but also their children or starting with their children and then engaging parents that way. Um, another would be to increase accessibility and address barriers to participation in BCCs, um, which Lakeisha covered, but uh, making participation in BCCs convenient, such as virtual and hybrid meetings um, for individuals with limited time or competing demands, expanding compensation practices to minimize financial impact of participation, especially if you're looking to engage residents across income ranges, um, continue to offer and strengthen interpretation translation services and needed accommodations for residents with language barriers and or disabilities for full engagement. Um, and then engaging residents as youth uh, by adding seats to BCCs that, that would be designated for youth. And there are a number of other considerations um, and conclusions related to inclusion and the structure of BCCs. So one is to deliberately build inclusive climates uh, one finding is, um, and we asked in the surveys about diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives or best practices, and there are a number of BCCs about half have not implemented um, DEI initiatives or best practices and deliberately or inten have intentional strategies. So uh, consideration here is to provide resources to encourage BCCs to make time to deepen their understanding and appreciation of one another's communities. So these are ways to increase understanding as well and inclusion um, to help BCC members, members understand how people's lived experiences and intersecting identities and abilities shape how they perceive the world, shape their perspectives, their ideas, and also the solutions and ideas that they bring to, see, to the boards, um, committees, and missions. And another consideration is around um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and how to strengthen it, continually strengthen it. So we asked members to um, to give their impressions of DEI in the BCCs, and they felt that generally representation, inclusion, and equity, um, that in terms of that, they generally felt that BCCs were welcoming, that they were inclusive, and that they promoted equity in members' contributions, but they also felt that the diversity of members of membership of ideas and diversity of, of perspectives could be increased. Another consideration is to have additional training and capacity um, to share BCC efforts and operations in a timely manner with the public. And this consideration comes from the finding that some liaisons express some um, confusion about the information that they should share with the public, particularly on the websites. So 
uh, consideration here, recommendations to continue to build capacity and understanding with NBCCs regarding the information sharing. That's imp and that is important to ensure that there's accurate information, timely information, and comprehensive data that are available. And another recommendation is to expand, examine the impact of positions that do not expire or uh, that are life appointments. And again, this um, around the cycling of members on BCCs due to that perception that there might not be as much change over time and there are impacts to that. Um, the county may want to consider assessing the impact of positions that are life terms or that do not expire. And then finally, as was mentioned earlier, there are over 90 BCCs that so the county uh, may want to consider a process to assess and revisit the number of boards, commissions, and committees, and um, instituting a process to determine the effectiveness of the BCCs, to restructure them um, if needed, to combine or to dissolve any as appropriate. Thank you. And if there are any Time for questions and comments. Great, That's wonderful. Fine. Thank, Thank you, you so for that. Much. I think before we turn it over uh, for questions and comments, I want to see if the uh, county exec's office would like to provide some remarks and reactions. Good morning, Chair Stewart. Uh, for the record, my name is Ken Hartman Espot. I'm the, the director of strategic partnerships in the county executive's office, and I have the distinct pleasure of working with my colleague here, Beth Gokrek, on managing the the appointment process for our 93 and growing boards and commissions uh, in Montgomery County. Uh, uh, for your um, <coughs> uh, awareness, there are, there are a total of 1,400 total positions in our in our um, boards and commissions, and we, we process 600 applications per year and send over 400 uh, appointments for your, you to confirm every year. So there is, um, there is a great deal of work that happens behind the curtain to make the trains run. Um, um, including um, regular staff check-ins with all of our liaisons. So I, I do want to thank um, Mark Strada and their, their team for for this report. I, I, I think um, overall the findings are good ones and and mesh with where we uh, in the county executive's office see the needs moving forward in our boards and commissions. Uh, we um, the the. the I'll speak for myself. The, the primary challenge we have with our boards and commission system is that it's based on a 1970s model of community participation. And so it's, it's really uh, based on uh, finding people who have knowledge, time, um, uh, and access to, to, to get to the materials that they're to talk about. And frequently we, we recruit people who have an interest in that area. Uh, have a strong interest in that area, strong enough to seek out um, uh, and volunteer for our boards and commissions. So um, we we are currently working, and and um, and uh, the the findings um, complement our work with our innovation group on developing a rubric for our committee evaluation and a review board. Uh, we've uh, we're current we're starting interviews next week for the eleven members of this once in a while committee. Uh, the last committee presented rep recommendations to the County Council in 2015, so we are due. Um, and one of the, the the challenges I want this committee to focus on this year um, is on that issue of equity. Uh, are our um, committees supported? Do, do they have a communications plan for engaging with people who aren't at the table, let alone recruiting people to be at the table? Uh, do do our um, do our um, uh, 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 and is that is racial equity baked into their plans? As they will also look at um, are these committees still valid? Um, and the question that I'll pose to them is: Are there other models of engagement that we ought to be utilizing that either complement or or maybe take the place of these? Boards and commissions, because every one of these boards and commissions is, is attached to a county department that's charged with managing that subject matter for us, for the council and the executive. So, do these fulfill the purpose for which they were originally intended for, or is there another uh, engagement strategy that we ought to be in, um, pursuing? And I, I do want to say that currently reviewing the, you'll soon get the OLO report on community participation. 
we are in our process. Typically, the executive or the CAO is given a three-week time period to to develop a point-by-point -point response. And and while that didn't occur in this in this um, um, occasion, uh, we 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 do uh, appreciate um, the work that's been done because uh, again, it it matches our thinking as we approach this new committee and we approach our boards and committees um, strategy. I do want to say, and Beth will be happy um, come Monday, is when we are, our person, staff support person begins right. um, in the office, um, because it is a, a lot of work to, to not only manage all, all the appointments that come to you, but also uh, liaise with, because um, every one of these 93 committees has a staff person or staff people that have qu lots of questions for us on how to do things. So I'll stop there, and I appreciate and look forward to engaging with the committee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for both being here and the work you do on this. I'm uh, going to kick us off and ask a couple of questions and then turn it over to my colleagues. Um, and um, I have some questions on, on methodology. And well, first I want to say thank you for the excellent report and the details. I think uh, it is really helpful. Many of us had questions and um, hearing from uh, Mr. Um, uh, Hartman Espada, it sounds like it came at a perfect time <laughs> um, also for the county exec's office to look at these issues. Um, and I think also the appendix, I know probably took a long time uh, to collect and put together, but having that information on the 90 plus uh, committees and looking at the breakdown and everything I, I think was really helpful. So um, thank you. Um, so some of my questions have to do um, with the, um, the methodology and um, one was, you know, you had a great response rate um, uh, for the different groups. Um, and I was wondering if we could get a copy of the questionnaire because I don't think I saw that um, in the report. So yeah, and I think yeah. because that leads to my questions regarding um, question wording, um, particularly on the gender question and race and ethnicity, um, because it did jump out at me that four in ten of the respondents did not provide an answer to the race and ethnicity question. You said you also had some challenges on gender. So I don't know if you have it in front of you, but if you could talk a little bit more about how those questions were asked and, yeah. Sure. So gender data was gathered from the county executive spreadsheet, right? So that's the county executive's data. Um, just because we didn't expect every member to respond to our survey, it just doesn't happen, right? So we went with the um, healthier, more substantive data, which is what the county executive's office collects around gender through applications, right? So the data you're seeing around gender is from their application process um, just because uh, yeah, we were well aware that all thousand uh, members were not going to respond to the survey. Um, and so that's collected well, it seems, through the application process. What wasn't collected um, particularly well is the race and ethnicity data through the application process. It's not a requirement. Um, I don't know that gender is a requirement either. And through, so through the survey, um, folks responded to it actually more often than other questions. So I don't think that that was a, a question where there was a lower response rate, right? I think there were probably lower response rates around how folks identify um, in terms of uh, their LGBTQ membership, right? There was some sensitivity around there. So we had some folks comment here and there, why are you asking this? Uh, maybe a handful of people um, didn't uh, understand the value of this process and sharing this information and helping the county understand who's in these advisory bodies, right? So, but. And we also um, were um, careful with the wording of the questions looking at it based on research for the racial um, identity, gender identity, and um, also in terms of sexual orientation or uh, gender identity. So. We did, um, so there are a number of categories that may be more than you, you may see in you know, other surveys, or um, we were careful to, uh, to have that breakdown so people could kind of see themselves in the questions and also have the opportunity to um, self-identify. Did you ask a question about ethnicity first and then race? Is, 
So anyway, my background is in survey methodology. Yes. So <laughs> I'm just going to be full disclosure, and you can get yeah. back to us on those questions. But I do think it said in the report that four in ten of the respondents did not respond to the race and ethnicity question. So I'm kind of I'm not forty one percent did it, but that's a, in combination with the county data and the survey data, right? So for forty one percent of members, including ex officio, which might be staff, right? Um, didn't provide their race and ethnicity. Uh, and so I don't know that that's really a survey issue. I think generally speaking, um, people feel a particular way about their race and ethnicity and, and revealing it. Um, and so the way we, I'm, I'll look at the question again, but um, we do know that there are particular ethnic groups that don't identify racially, right? So they're in the Latino community, you don't necessarily identify by race, right? So if That's you why ask, I ask if you ask the ethnicity someone, question first, yeah. Um, well, we don't like to separate it out because usually the identity of Latino is just your identity, right? You're not Latino and white, you're not Latino and something else unless you are, you consider yourself multiracial, but generally speaking, um, Latinos across the board just identified it as Latino and then some of them selected white here and there, and then some identified as multiracial and included a number of different groups. But it was to give them the flexibility of not having to identify racially, I believe, is the way that we set it up, but I'll double check. Yeah. And people could select, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Could select all that applied to them, so they were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It would be great to see it. So, I mean, there's a large body of research looking at ethnicity and race and how to um, ask these questions, and in particular, um, as researchers had to think about how the why you're telling people you're collecting those data um, to get them. And so I guess I just, this is a great report and going to be really useful. The only, like one of the only flags for me is that methodology and how that was communicated to folks. I think having more information from you all on that would be really helpful because um, you know, we're not going to do this all the time. <laughs> this is really a benchmark for us. So, and I think Mr. Hartman Espada wanted to say something. Yes. So the, their experience, it, uh, of course, they, they used our, our data. We do ask race and then ethnicity on the application form. Um, about 25% of people who apply don't answer those questions. So we're, we're uh, during the interview process, we do ask staff to give us feedback. But again, that's not perfect. If someone's not self-identifying, you're relying on someone's attestation of, or impression, and that's not something we record. Um, but it, it, we try to capture that during the interview process. Thank you, and I do think that's a, a good place for this committee also to look at and maybe work with our uh, racial equity and justice um, folks uh, that ha how are we doing this and collecting the data and what information we're providing to people about how those data will be used and to the purpose because I have found that lots of times when you provide that information, it people are much more understanding of the context and how the data will be used. Um, so I think that's something just to explore further. Uh, the other question I had is, um, were the questionnaires done in English or in uh, multiple languages? They were done, um, I think it was just English, yeah. yeah. Do we have any sense that that might have been a barrier to completion for some folks? Not necessarily given the educational levels, but, um, and no one reached out and asked for it in another language either. So we had folks reach out when they had trouble accessing the survey, but no one um, said anything about uh, language barriers. Great. Um, and then my final question on methodology, and then I'll turn it over to other folks is, um, on the geographic breakdown, um, Silver Spring is a big area. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, we have that struggle all the time um, on the council. And I just wanted to confirm, you said you were using, um, like with gender, on geography, the information that you were provided. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Right. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, is there any way, maybe this is a question for Olo, if you looked at it, any way of breaking down Silver Spring into smaller categories and geographic areas to look at? Um, I guess if we receive some guidance around what those areas would be in zip codes, I mean, what we have is the word Silver Spring and then zip codes, right? Yeah. So 
Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we can look I'm at sure. that. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Silver Spring encompasses right. what is considered Silver Spring encompasses a rather large area, and, it's, right. and within that is very diverse. So actually sure. thinking mm -hmm. about where we're pulling representation for our committees, you mm -hmm. know, this, I think that matters um, moving forward. Um, all right. I have a bunch of other questions. I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. First, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. Thank you all very, very much for doing this this report, this presentation. You know, we can't appoint somebody unless they apply. I mean, bottom line, basic. So we need to obviously communicate as much as we always believe we are communicating. We're, if it's not working, we're not communicating the way that we need for it to do. And I'm not suggesting that in some cases this isn't working because each committee has a, has a, um, a life of its own. Uh, there are people that will apply for the 93 committees. They'll apply for the one committee that they're interested in. And the others, you know, I'm glad someone's doing it, but that someone's not going to be me type of thing. So we have to, I think we need to look at individual committees and what the makeup is of those individual committees. Because just to say overall, we have, you know, the percentages and and who did and who didn't tell you what, what, what their uh, backgrounds are. But I think that does matter, and because on the, on the, uh, the committee itself. And, and it's, then again, it's, inter it's who's interested in that committee and who has the time to do the work. And we have a lot of competition for volunteering. Uh, I mean, Aaron, what, what you've looked at is the, is the volunteering for Montgomery County, but uh, we have a few municipalities that also have committees. We have people whose children are in school and they're active with the PTA. You talked about, you know, the people under 29. Well, if somebody's still a student, they have committees for the, the camera club or whatever that they're on. There's only so much time. And so, therefore, we have to look. And thank goodness we have a very robust uh, volunteer fire department. But somebody who's doing that might not necessarily, unless it's for fire services, they might not say, I can do another committee too. I mean, every now and then they like to go home. So I, I think that becomes an inter, a, a, a something of interest. We also have, and it's my understanding that the civic clubs have run into some issues too for membership, the, the rotaries and the chambers of commerce and et cetera. And then there's committees involved in each one of those groups and how they're going to do it. So our competition is pretty good. And the people that are doing that work, though not directly volunteering for Montgomery County, are helping people in Montgomery County. So I think we need to, to look at that. Years ago, I mentioned this earlier, when I was the president of the Maryland Municipal League, they decided that I think it was 30 plus members on the board. And everybody said, you know, this is just way too much. We, we have, uh, you know, uh, district people and at-large people and and, and, uh, commit, and the uh, various uh, influences from, um, from uh, department representatives, and we really need to get a smaller board. And everybody sitting at the table said, yeah, we agree. And nobody wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. Everybody said, you know, I understand we should have a smaller board, but don't get rid of my position. My position's important. And we're going to run into that as well. So I, I think, and, and to the one point, and I'll, I'll stop here, but to the point about the geographics, the way that it, there are people that will say that they live in Silver Spring, and though Silver Spring is a, is a, a mailing area, it's not a municipality, they, they do live in Silver Spring, but it's, you can live at one end of the, you know, to the other, and, it, and in their opinion, they're not in that part of Silver Spring. We have that in, from in the up county. I mean, there are people with a Gaithersburg mailing address that I consider in Laytonsville. They're my good friends. I'm very happy they're there, but we can't just go by that. So I, I think that, that your report is, is a huge help. I think that we need to communicate better and do all of those things, but bottom line is that many times these types of reports just show us what we need to be doing rather than what we're doing. And, and the only other thing I did want to say is that some of these committees, it depends on the influence that they believe that they're doing or helping. 
And I don't know whether that's one of the questions that should be asked. And I think you did touch on it. But one of the questions that should be asked is, did, was this committee, did this committee do what you thought it was going to do? And, and I don't know that they always do. So anyhow, thank you very much for what you do. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Thank you. Council President Friedson. Thank you. First of all, this is a huge topic, and I know it's just a bear uh, to take on. So thank you for that. Uh, and I really appreciate all the work that, that went into this. And there's a lot of analysis, and uh, the analysis begets more analysis. So no good deed goes unpunished. And I think this is really the textbook case of, of that. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. Obviously, it really speaks to the heart of how we set up government, how people participate in government. Uh, this is a question of boards, committees, and commissions, but it's also a question in general of how we do the people's work. And so, you know, I think we need to be mindful of that as we as we talk about it. Um, I, I don't want to steal the thunder of my colleague, so I'll let her say it herself. But. <laughs> You know, there's a glaring lack of representation in the up county that's not unique to boards, committees, and commissions, but certainly uh, it is seen with a glaring light here. Uh, and, and, you know, I think it speaks to some intentionality that we need to have, not just with racial equity, but with the geographic representation. Uh, we need both. Uh, and I think it speaks to not just the recruitment, which is really what has been discussed here mostly, it's about when the meetings are, where the meetings are, what the topics of these and the substance of these issues. Are they more down county focused issues or are they up county or are they a combination of, of the two? So I think there's there's lots of impact there. So um, with that, a couple questions. One, uh, we have many challenges with the boards, committees, and commissions in terms of representation, who can participate, who can't. There's a lot of detail in this analysis that talks about that and a lot of grappling that we ought to do. Um, the other aspect of it is the term waivers that come before us. Was there any analysis about who gets a term waiver and who doesn't? We, we, we go through a lot of term waivers where essentially you can only serve two terms term is two years or four years or one year, whatever the case may be, three years. And, you know, as a matter of course, uh, nobody likes to upset the apple cart, so they're generally approved. These are ordinarily volunteers who are serving the community, and it's, I think, hard for the council to basically turn down a volunteer, uh, which is essentially what we're looking at based on a recommendation that comes from the executive. Uh, but it begs the question of who are continuing and who aren't, is that exacerbating this representative challenge? What's the geographic makeup? What's the racial makeup? What's the age makeup of those individuals? Is there any analysis on that? Um, one piece of information we do have is that half of the waiver requests were from members of the public. There were a smaller number um, that were representatives or small or large businesses. And um, there were others who were um, professors or commission members, technical experts, um, veterans or relatives um, of persons with disabilities. So those were some of who requested papers. And just to clarify, this was captured differently. So this wasn't in the initial spreadsheet we received. This wasn't part of the survey. This was data that um, was collected separately, right? Um, just reviewing term waiver applications and just noting, oh, this one came in this year and that year. And so that's what the data we were provided. So it wasn't robust data around term yeah. waivers. Yeah. yeah, I think that's something that we really, we've been talking about that for a while, but that's something that we really need to look at because, you know, we do have a challenge in local government where, you know, some people call it the committed 100, maybe it's mm -hmm. the committed 1,000, but the same people serve in every role here. You know, the same people who interview for positions on citizen boards, the same people who show up and, and sit here. And, and we love those people. I, I, I love those people. They are some of the most civic-minded, detail-oriented, uh, you know, impressive people that we have in the community. But those aren't all the people we have in the community. So, uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, I think the, 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 the sheer magnitude of the term waivers is, you know, maybe it's not the disease, but it reflects the symptom of the, the broader challenge of having more representative uh, communities that uh, are, are addressing this. So that, that's one. Number two, you mentioned the 600 applications. Thank you very much. I was one of those applications before I served on uh, the county council. I, 
uh, so I went through your office. I received the notification. I you know, waited to get my letter from the county executive and go through the process. And it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, very much uh, appreciated with the Collaboration Council for Children, Youth, and Families. That was really my, you know, entree into county government in a more formal way than just showing up to meetings. Of those 600, have we done an analysis of? You know how different the applicant pool looks from the actual membership pool. I would just, as we look at it, I didn't think so, but as we look at, it, I mean, to me, that's a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. Of, you know, we focus a lot on recruitment. I mean, that's what you know. Are we recruiting the right way? But the question also should be of the people who we're recruiting, who are we picking? Because, you know, I've used the take the reservation versus holding the reservation. Uh, you know, that's really the most important part of the reservation, right? I mean, it's really not who we get to apply. It's who we select mm -hmm. for these uh, roles. So um, if there is an opportunity, I know that could be, you know, uh, you know, a lip. But we already have the boards, committees, and commission demographic makeup to a certain extent as part of this looking at the applicant pool to the extent we can. I know that people are not self-identifying every bit of uh, information, but uh, if we can capture that in some way, I think that would really help us to understand, you know, the SWOT analysis here. You know, it, is it really that we're not recruiting the right people, it might be, or is it among the people we have recruited, we're only selecting the people we already know? And I just, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that's a question that ought to be asked, I just wanted to uh, put that forward as something to consider as we continue to do this work and to peel back the layers and for this analysis to beget more analysis. So with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you so much, Council President Friedson, for the, those, those points. Uh, and term, term waivers are a concern of, of ours. Uh, I've made it very clear to our staff that they are to be rare. Uh, I think in the last year, we've processed 10 and even that's too high, uh, 10 of the, the 400 that you've received. Um, but the, um, the, 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 the matter I wanted to echo f for you is on selection. Uh, as our departments and our committees do the interviews of our candidates, we, uh, and they provide us a rank list. They don't tell us this is our favorite. They tell us here are the people we interviewed, and here's how we'd rank them. At the end of the day, it's the county executives pick from that list. And one of the questions the county executive um, uh, always asks is, what is the racial, ethnic, uh, gender makeup of the applicants that have been presented to me? So uh, we, we, we're happy to, to do a deeper dive into that to, to see how we shook out um, applications to appointments. I, I think that, that would add value. Um, before I turn it over to uh, Councilmember Balcom, I wanted to ask a follow-up question to what Council President Friedson did, which is, um, so the length of time uh, to appoint person, I know there, uh, the capacity issues, and, but I think the report said it's about averaging four months um, to process. Um, and thinking about uh, Council President Friedson, who is obviously sitting at his mailbox waiting for his letter. <laughs> um, but I, I do know for sometimes there are people who, you know, four months seems like uh, a good deal of time. Is there, as you're looking at this committee or looking for uh, at um, cha making changes, is, is there a way that we could speed up that process? Absolutely. And it's a frequent discussion Beth and I have had. Uh, is there a way we can speed this up? Um, what what is the division of labor between the executive's office and the department? Mm -hmm. uh, is is there a way to to move that line so that we avoid bottlenecks? Um, uh, and it, it, yes, it's something we 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 are continuously exploring, and there may be additional adjustments made, just so we can do the the vetting in a timely fashion. We certainly put a priority on if we've got somebody who sent us an application, that is our top priority to move them through before we, we bring more uh, people into the queue. So where you'll see uh, a greater challenge is on uh, the timing of the application for vacancies. Mm -hmm. that, that, that slows so we can handle those in the pipeline. And with the additional staff person um, next week, um, we, we are hoping um, to, to, to provide Beth the support mm -hmm. she needs and also to review how can our departments and our staff for the BCCs, help us do some of the work um, so that it, people flow through. It's, 
It's how bad the, um, sometimes this is like uh, Lucy and Ethel at the, at the chocolate factory mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, you have to keep the chocolates moving and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's part of the, the, our challenge. Thank you. Councilmember Malcolm. Thank you. Uh, I thought this was an excellent report, and um, I think it, it really dovetails with the report that we're going to receive next week in terms of uh, community outreach. Uh, it really is uh, uh, like part A, part B of that, so I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I wasn't surprised by anything in the report. Uh, one of the things when, you know, when I started in this position, when we started to get the, um, the uh, nominations, I look, every single board and commission that we get, every single nomination, I go through the roster and I do a tally. And it, it, it was shocking to me anecdotally uh, of the lack of geographic representation and so I wasn't surprised. Um, I, if anything, I, I, it, it's really stark, 51 people from Germantown compared to 200 some from Silver Spring, understanding the amorphous nature of both of those mm -hmm. uh, ge geographies, right? Uh, but it's just so stark. And um, what, there are several, um, lots of issues, as, as Council Mem uh, Mem President Friedson mentioned, this, there's a lot to unpack. But the issue is, if there is a, if there is, um, a BCC, that is countywide, that is looking at a countywide issue, there needs to be countywide representation. Um, I understand because I have several uh, commissions up my way that are not geographic representation because they focus on whether it's the Ag Reserve or a Rustic Road, those types of things. Even the Rustic Road Commission has non up county members on it, right? So, um, so I, I think that we just need to be clear about that. Um, but I would suggest that further recruitment and selection of people in the up county area, particularly uh, Gaithersburg, Germantown, Clarksburg, will help to provide a more racial and ethnic diverse population, particularly when, when we're looking at um, our Asian selection. Uh, our, our Asian representation. So it's not just the geographic representation, but um, uh, G uh, Germantown is second only to Gaithersburg as the most diverse community in the nation. Uh, so I think we're just missing the boat in, in that regard. Um, but I also want to talk about um, why it's so critical. Uh, Germantown Clarksburg is a community that has no voice and which means that they're just not represented, not just boards and commissions, but um, the voting process. The, that area of the county is the lowest, has the lowest voting participation. Half as uh, the percentage, half the percentage of people in the up county vote compared to uh, Silver Spring. So, um, so that is an issue. The solution, uh, and I want to talk about a couple things. Um, I'm not. To, I'm going to get off my soapbox in a minute, but um, mm -hmm. the solution cannot be to ask unempowered people to empower themselves. The county has a responsibility to uh, for outreach. Um, we cannot just look at this and say, "Well, they just need to apply more." <clears throat> That's not the answer. So. Um, I look forward to, to really working on it and, and really looking at the uh, report that we're going to receive next week. I think that's, it, it really uh, speaks to that. Um, so just a couple things. Um, the, the other thing about uh, why it's so important, it really is building a bench. Uh, these boards and commissions, um, my first entree into county government was being on the Up County Citizens Advisory Board. And I'm sure that uh, all of us have served on these boards. So it, it is building a bench. It's sometimes, sometimes it's the first entree into a really meaningful, lifelong participation in county government. So um, I just wanted to mention that. So term waivers, um, I think that's important. This is a closed loop system. Um, uh, very often on boards and commissions when it's time for nominations, um, the, 
the, ex the sitting committee is asked, do you have anybody that could come on this board? And so it's just so we get the same people, the, the neighbors of the person who's on there or um, a colleague. So it's, it, it is a closed loop, loose, closed loop system. Um, I appreciate um, uh, Mr. Hartman's uh, view of, you know, this is an old model in a new, in a new world. Um, so uh, maybe the 7 p.m. Wednesday night meeting uh, isn't, isn't what's going to work. Um, so I think that's, that's a good issue. But in the term waivers, there's the phrase, you can request a term, uh, a term waiver uh, for a couple reasons, but one of the reasons you can get a term waiver is if no other qualified individual is available. That should be stricken because in a, in a community, in a county of 1.1 million people, uh, a very high, uh, diverse, highly intelligent, skilled uh, community, there is no such thing as no other qualified individual being available. Of course they are, we just don't know who they are. Um, so I think that's an issue. And then term limits. Again, I, I think that every, um, every BCC should have a term limit. The term limits should be the same. Um, uh, and I understand that there are certain positions on the committees that are te technical um, or non or ex officio. Um, so perhaps there's a distinction between an ex officio member and a public member. But but public community members, th there should be term limits. And on a very, very rare occasion, uh, have a term waiver because we just need to cycle people through. But I would, I would suggest that even the ex officio members, um, there should be uh, cycling through and because of the uh, if someone's been on a, on a commission for 20 years um, there are new people with different demographics uh, and again from even from a county perspective um, it's it's uh, professional development so we need to get people we need the the county needs to cycle its people its employees through the same way as our public. Um, so, and, and the issue of how many committees, uh, I, 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 I appreciate the, that there will be a very serious look at that. And I know how difficult it is to um, terminate a committee, mm -hmm. um, but we just have to look at the staff capacity for this. And, and really the usefulness of it. Um, and so I think that, that you know, I'm very happy to roll up my sleeves and, and um, share my opinions with anyone who will listen to them. <laughs> um, and I appreciate, uh, thank you for uh, letting me sit in. And uh, I really thank you for looking at the geography because um, that is just so striking. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I do want to give a chance. I know we have our, our county clerk, our council clerk here, um, and this report did not really cover the council appointment process and, and committees, but Ms. Hanover, if you wanted to say a few words or observations, or if you just wanted to sit in, that's good too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would. The only thing I would comment on is that the council doesn't currently use a database to manage applications for boards, committees, and commissions, and therefore don't also have data. Um, as deep as the executive branch has um, on the, the demographics and things like that. So I think that would be a helpful um, thing for the council to consider moving forward uh, to better manage the applications and process and, and um, all the people involved in it to get that data as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have one other question. Um, on the um, committee that's going to be looking at committees. Um, I think uh, it was said that, that uh, the application process is moving forward on that. Um, if you could, could you tell us a little bit more of who you expect to serve on that committee? So we, we, we are uh, beginning interviews next week for the 11 um, positions and we have uh, 12 applicants. <laughs> 11 and and so we I'm treating this as a open till filled 
Mm -hmm. So uh, it, uh, we, 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 we do want to make sure this committee, yeah. and, and back in the day, this used to be called the Committee on Committees, and mm -hmm. then the council decided that's not, <laughs> that's like bureaucracy yeah. 2.0. Um, so we're, we, um, we're, we're starting those interviews, and um, uh, we, will, we will evaluate who we have. Um, we're going to move forward those, you know, th that we uh, want to move forward and, and keep, um, and, and if we don't have that, geographic and racial um, 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 uh, um, makeup, we, we will re-advertise. And one of the things we, Beth and I have also talked about is starting to treat the, some of these board and committee um, processes as open till filled. Mm -hmm. Because when we have a process that has a deadline, you, you only get those people who come in by the deadline. And there may be people who come in afterwards and, and you, you want to you, uh, we did this recently for the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities mm -hmm. Commission. We purposely held back one seat, which I'm happy to say we recently filled with a, with a, um, a Latino woman who, who um, has a, is a mom of a child with IDD, and she's now on the committee. And that was done so that we had that space uh, because um, – but, but we'll we'll be looking at that at that more moving forward. Um, but that, so our process is to to interview, get get a core group to you, fill in any gaps that we may have may have with our applicant pool as we go along. Because this committee, we can't hold up its work mm -hmm. um, because once they start, they have a year to send you a, an initial report, and then another year. So this is we want to rush, not rush. We want mm -hmm. we want to expedite. Um, solutions um, during this process and not hold off and say we can't do anything for two years. Great. Well, thank you for that. I'm not seeing any other comments or questions. Uh, again, we look forward to working with the executive branch on these issues um, moving forward. And again, I just want to say a huge thank you to Olo and uh, to uh, the folks who did the report. We know this was a lot <laughs> to process, pulling in uh, data from different sources and everything. And uh, yeah, I think you always know a good research project when there's more questions um, that come from it. And mm -hmm. we look forward to following up, getting the um, questionnaire that was, um, was used, and um, look forward to digging into this more. So thank you for all your hard work on this um, and taking the time to be with us this morning. And with that, we are Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee is done for the morning. Thank you.